Yeah, so it will help if you take out your notes. Um, men, go ahead and borrow them from your wife. There, she's the one who got it when she came through the door. Um, today we're going to be looking at chapter 9 of Revelation, and if things did not get weird enough yet, here it comes. Get ready. Um, hopefully that as we go through this, it is uh, helpful for your understanding, not only of this piece of Scripture, but of all of Scripture, as we've talked about, the understanding what it meant to the original audience and using that to help interpret it for us as well. Um, it seems like many Bible scholars understand that and they approach the Bible that way, but when they get to Revelation, they throw normal hermeneutic out the window and start reading the newspaper and fantasizing about crazy things that just don't follow along with the rest of God's revealed reality in our experience. Um, you know, uh, and we'll see that today when we talk about some of the things that we uh, often visualize, and we'll talk about that as we get to it. So today we look at the fifth and sixth trumpet that is blown. If you remember, we were given the introduction, the letters to the churches, in the throne room where the lamb is given the scroll with the seven seals, he opens those seven seals, and in the seventh seal, we see seven angels given seven trumpets, and last week we looked at the first four trumpets, today we will look at the next two trumpets, and then just like with the seals, if you remember, between six and seven there was a pause, there was a, a chapter where we had the sealing of the 144,000 and the multitude. Um, there will be a pause after seal or after trumpet six today before we hit trumpet seven two weeks from today, which will be chapter 11, which will be halfway through the book of Revelation, and you'll understand the first half. Aren't you excited about that? Okay. Let's take a moment and pray and ask God to uh, give us insight this morning. Father, we come before you wanting not only to understand, but to be able to apply the truth of your word. God, help us to uh, understand its meaning to that first century audience, those who the letter is addressed to. And Father, I pray that in the midst of that, that we might uh, be able to sympathize with our brothers and sisters in Christ in their experience uh, in the first century and how it affects our experience today as part of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so today uh, we are looking at a passage that's pretty interesting. Uh, I entitled the sermon, The Bug King, um, because we will be introduced to a king of the bugs. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is how helpful it is to know both the teachings of Jesus and uh, the prophets in the Old Testament when you're trying to understand the book of Revelation. Oftentimes when we look at Revelation, we act as if it stands alone, as if it has no connection with the rest of the Bible, and it really makes it difficult to understand what's going on. But when we are familiar with some of Jesus' teaching and the teaching of the Old Testament, it really kind of helps put perspective on the things that we read in this closing book of the New Testament. But I, I found this statement by Jesus that is quite interesting um, because it very much applies, in, in some ways oddly applies, to the passage that we will be looking at in Revelation chapter 9. This is in, recorded in the Gospel of Luke when Jesus sends out 72 disciples to go and proclaim that the kingdom of God has come and uh, those 72 disciples go out, and then they come back, and he sa they say this. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So they're excited because they were able to cast out evil spirits. Um, as they went around and found people who were demon-possessed, they would cast those demons out. And they were saying, you know, th this power and authority comes from your name, as if Jesus didn't know that. And then he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. 
Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What's fascinating about this is, one, Jesus describes this idea of the fallen angel Lucifer falling from heaven, um, and that he makes the point that there is a power of the energy of, of the enemy speaking about evil spirits here, right? Fallen angels. And he uses the term serpents and scorpions to describe them. Well, today, chapter nine, we will see evil spirits released and they will look like scorpions and locusts, like bugs. Uh, they will be have like a serpent in their tail. Um, this kind of terminology is used for the spiritual realm. Um, I do want to touch on one thing. We live in a modern age where oftentimes I've had people say to me, oh, yeah, well, I believe in God, but you don't really believe in demons, do you? And just first of all, when we say I try not to use the word demons because demons has a lot of baggage in our culture movie baggage, right? Um, and so I tend to think of, uh, use the terminology, fallen angels or evil spirits or even unclean spirits. Those are kind of terms that are used in the New Testament. All of those represent a spiritual realm that exists and evil spiritual angels, if you will, who have fallen with the devil. And so many people have told me, oh, I believe in Jesus. You know, I believe in God. I just don't believe in all that, that other stuff. And I said, well, how can you believe in them when they said that the other stuff exists? They're the ones who are making the argument for these, this evil realm, this spiritual world that exists in some ways parallel to ours, that impacts ours. Here we are going to see a spiritual realm impact in the first century judgment of the city of Jerusalem. And I think you'll see that there was a, a spiritual, uh, re a release of evil spiritual power in the city of Jerusalem in the first century. And we not only will see it by reading chapter 9 of Revelation, but we'll see it by reading Josephus, the first century historian who recorded what was going on in the Jewish-Roman uh, War. And so, with that said, um, remembering the words of Jesus, talking about the spirits, Satan falling from heaven, um, this idea that we are protected by the seal of God, um, by, by the Holy Spirit, um, we begin chapter 1 with a section that talks about these tormentors from hell. Listen, it says, the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star, star op often representing a significant individual. I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he, meaning it is a being, right? It has a, not it. He was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like smoke from a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. So you kind of get this visual that uh, uh, probably is not a great mystery that we're talking about Satan here. Uh, go like this, because, uh, yeah, okay, well, we got that part. They open it, and it, you get the sense of a first century opening up this dark furnace where there's hot fire and this dirty smoke rising up. Bad stuff is in the pit. That's the impression we're given. And as it opens, we say that uh, we read, then from the smoke came locusts on earth. And they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. And they were told, do not harm grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of, of God on their forehead. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. 
Here as we read this account, um, I think one of the things we often miss is just how limited these horrible curses, these plagues are. Um, Notice that there is uh, uh, limitations in that the angel was given the key. Who gave the angel the key? God, who has all authority. That even Satan is uh, subservient to God. That these things were given the power not to harm grass or plant. Why would they mention that? Because that's what locusts do. Which implies that these are not locusts. But they are they cause things to happen like locusts. What do locusts do? They come in, they wipe out all your farmland, and they cause a famine, which makes you miserable. And they torment. They torment through famine. Uh, notice the limitation that they're not allowed to kill, but they're only allowed to torment, and that for a limited amount of time, for only five months. And it's a torment like that of a scorpion, when it stings someone. Again, that sounds really bad, right? But when you take a step back, you realize it's just a scorpion sting. You don't die from it, but it hurts a lot. It's a torment. What's interesting is oftentimes we read this passage, and I don't know how many of you have heard this one, uh, that it's like a helicopter, military helicopter, anyone? Oh, I'm so proud that so few of you have heard of that. Um, but this idea that, you know, they're, they're shooting missiles out of the tail and all this stuff um, is inconsistent with what this is talking about. Clearly, these things are coming up out of the pit of hell. These are spiritual beings who are coming in and have the ability to torment, to harass, to make you miserable. Um, one of the things that we see that this torment is so bad that people will wish they were dead. It is so uncomfortable, so their life will become so difficult that they will wish that they could die, but they can't. This idea is that they're, they're not locusts and scorpions, but they have the effects of locusts and scorpions. They bring about famine and plague and misery, but not so bad that it kills you. Interestingly, uh, we find out historically, and this is recorded by F.F. Bruce in New Testament history, that the final siege of Jerusalem lasted five months. And there were some interesting things going on during that siege. It says, Titus began the siege of Jerusalem on April 70, the defenders held out desperately for five months, but by the end of August, the temple area was occupied and the holy house burned down. Uh, It seems to indicate that this is a a, a record of those final stands in Jerusalem. And one of the things that we find out is that it, during those five months, that there was more trouble inside the walls than outside the walls. And we would have no record of this had Josephus not recorded what was going on inside the walls. Josephus is a Jewish historian, and we'll read a little bit of what he records of what's going on inside the walls or what went on inside the walls. He has a Jewish background, Josephus is a historian, but he is writing history because he has been captured by Romans, So he will write a Jewish history from a Roman perspective, kind of understand what his bias is. Clearly, his writings are not inspired by God, but they are a good historic record and considered the most reliable historic record of this time frame. Here is an interesting passage that uh, I saw referenced in regard to what's going on here. This idea of unclean spirits of fallen angels impacting the lives of people. Um, And many of you know Jesus cast out demons throughout his ministry time. 
And there is an interesting statement he makes about casting out demons. And I didn't think it was all that fascinating until I read the last sentence. Listen to what it says. When the unclean spirit has gone out of the person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the, la- and the last state of the person is worse than the first. So you hear this idea where you get, it's like the, the demons get cast out, but the person doesn't get the seal of God. The person doesn't come to Christ. They just have the demon removed. And ultimately what happens is they get it all cleaned up and then there's a resurgence of more demonic activity in the person's life. Okay, well, that's interesting. Then he says, so also will it be with this evil generation. This is a prediction or a foreshadowing of the evil influences that will impact Jerusalem within the generation of Jesus speaking. Jesus, the 72, the disciples, they went around Israel and demons were responding to the name of Jesus and leaving. In 70 AD, as the uh, Romans surrounded Jerusalem, we will find that evil activity among the Jews broke out like never before within the walls. This is what, uh, by the way, um, there ends up being three different groups that exist inside the walls of Jerusalem that are all fighting and killing each other while the Romans are surrounding the, the city, which is, Absolutely fascinating, because I bet up to this point, we all thought, well, you know, the Jews are all gathering together, and we got to work together to fight these Romans. That is not what was going on. They were killing each other. They were stealing from each other. There was chaos. And Josephus goes on and on about it, but I only chose to share with you a small portion that kind of gives us the idea of what's going on, but you're free to look at uh, the wars of the Jews, sometimes called the Jewish wars. Obviously, these are translations, so they translate it differently, but that's the two terms they use for this book. Um, And Josephus records this. When, therefore, Titus had marched over that desert, which lies between Egypt and Syria. Now, Titus, do you know who that guy is? He is the general who is the son of Vespasian, Vespasian began the siege of Jerusalem or began the, the, the war on uh, Israel. And then he leaves and Titus takes over. You with me? So Titus there is walking across the desert between Egypt and Syria. There's a reason he's coming from Egypt. He came to Caesarea, which is along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Beautiful place. We've been there. Um, having resolved to set his forces in order at that place before he began the war. The war to seize Jerusalem. He is getting his uh, army in uh, ready, ordered, there in Caesarea before they approach Jerusalem. Nay, indeed, while he is assisting his father at Alexandria. Now, if we're not familiar with these terms, it gets a little awkward. Um, He's assisting his father at Alexandria. Does anybody know where Alexandria is? It's in Egypt. Remember, he just came from Egypt. That's what it says. Uh, Vespasian goes to Alexandria because it's closer than going up to Rome to make his claim to be the emperor. He goes to Alexandria and cuts off their food supply because their food supply to Rome came from Egypt and went across the Mediterranean Sea. And so he goes there and cuts off their food supply and then Someone who supports his cause comes in and and takes Rome, and he becomes the emperor, Vespasian. So his son was helping him in Alexandria, coming across Caesarea, uh, setting up his his forces. Um, So he was assisting his father at Alexandria in setting up that government, which had been newly conferred upon them by God. So here Josephus is saying, 
God has preordained that Vespasian should be emperor. You catch that? Now, one, he's right. I mean, biblically, I think we even see the support that God put him in that place. But he's not saying it biblically. He's saying it because they'll kill him. (laughs) He is writing history for the Romans. So whoever wins, that's the one God wanted there. Um. And then he goes on to say, it so happened that the sedition at Jerusalem was revived and parted into three factions and that one faction fought against another. Each partition uh, in such evil cases may be said to be a good thing and the effect of divine justice. So he is making the claim that God was working in the midst of the city of Jerusalem by dividing them into three groups, which all fought each other which also happens to be supported by the book of Revelation. Josephus, historian, he records specific history. He doesn't know the writings of of Revelation. Um, He is recording stuff that is for the Romans. He is not inspired, but we see these strong parallels between what he is saying and what is described in the book of Revelation. And then a little bit further down, after some horrible descriptions of things that were going on in Jerusalem at that time, he says, Now, as the city was engaged in a war on all sides from these treacherous crowds of wicked men, the people of the city between them were like a great body torn in pieces. This is what's going on inside of Jerusalem. The aged men and women were in such distress by the internal calamities that they wished for the Romans and earnestly hoped for an external war in order to, uh, in order to their delivery for their domestic miseries. They were going through torment for five months. The tormentors were in Jerusalem for five months. After that, we go from torment to death because when the sixth trumpet blows the Roman army comes and they start killing people Revelation 9 7 says in appearance the locusts were like horses prepared for battle by the way how many of you thought the locusts look like locusts isn't that a fascinating in appearance the locusts look nothing like locusts Well, then why did you say locusts? That's our response, right? But he said it because he was saying they had the same effect as locusts. They wiped out their food supply. But in appearance, not in behavior, not in effect, but in appearance, the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair, women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots and horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. So they're able to hurt for five months to cause misery, not kill, They have a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, his name is Apollyon, which, by the way, both mean destroyer. The first woe has passed. Behold, two two woes are still to come. I thought he was, should say two more woes. That's why I kept wanting to put more in there, but that's my translation. Um, so remember the last three trumpets are the three woes. So we've got the fifth trumpet just blew. That's woe number one. The sixth trumpet about to blow. That's woe number two. And then the seventh trumpet will be the third woe. Um, now, I don't know how many of you know what a locust looks like. Because we don't call them locusts. What do we call them? They look like grasshoppers to us. Here's a a locust. 
Okay, you familiar with this? Not very scary. Well, maybe that size. If it was that big, it'd be a little scary. But not that scary to us. But when you see the sky darkened with them, and they come and clear out and all the food you've been growing all year, they're pretty terrifying. And so the idea that uh, they would have that kind of impact. Now, obviously, people read these descriptions and go, oh, that's pretty weird. I'm going to draw it, right? Um, and so this is the best rendition. There they are. Now, I'm going to take you. This is a great job, don't you think? And I wouldn't want it in my neighborhood. Um, <laughs> Here's the thing. This is the thing that drives me crazy about this book. Now, people, in all seriousness, drew this, wanting to tell us that someday on this earth, that thing will be roaming around the streets, stinging people. Has anything like this ever been a part of God's plan? When God did miraculous and supernatural and amazing things throughout history, when he conquered Jerusalem the first time with Babylon and carried them into captivity, when he wiped out Egypt, when he wiped out Edom, when he wiped out Babylon, those were all things God predicted and talked about. Do you ever send anything like this into the scene? There is this idea that when you get to Revelation, that's why I think we don't like to read it, all of a sudden we go into some sci-fi movie. It's not reality. We, we separate from reality. But what I'm telling you is the book of Revelation is about reality. It's about what God was really doing. And he wasn't building these things to come out of the bottomless pit. But if he did, I think they'd look like this. There you go. There's a picture you can't unsee. <laughs> You don't want that thing jumping on you. Okay, so there it is. That's my favorite. I'm going to have nightmares for that one. Um, What we see described there, I believe, is John's description visually of these fallen angels. Um, I, um, I do not look historically for some thing that these things represent. I believe John is given visually uh, an an appearance of the supernatural fallen angels and their impact on uh, Jerusalem in the first century. And so we see this torment that starts with them, and then we'll see beyond that um, the release of the army, which will then kill, not just torment for five months, but will come in and conquer the city of Jerusalem. Um, Remember, uh, Jesus says this towards the end of his Olivet Discourse, proclaiming the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. He says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jesus gives us a time frame there, right? You agree? This generation will not pass away. It's going to be within 40, 50 years. Um, he, it would be weird for him to say that if it was going to happen tomorrow, right? It would be weird for him to say that if it's going to happen in a month. That's a weird way to describe that. But if it's going to happen in decades... That's an appropriate way to describe it. If it's going to happen in 2,000 years, that's a very bad way to describe it. Now, here's a passage people use all the time saying, we, we have no idea when, God, when this is going to happen. But concerning the day and hour, no one knows. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying we don't know the specific time, Right? He's not saying no one has any idea. He just gave us an idea, literally, in the sentence before this one. So quit telling people that that's what this verse means. Read the verse before it. It's clear that this is qualifying his first statement, which is, you will not pass away. Some of you will not pass away before this happens. But I can't tell you when, because I don't even know exactly when. 
But concerning the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they will be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Do you see the flood coming and sweeping them away? Those are not the people who are saved. Those are the people who are killed. The Son of Man is coming and there will be judgment. And you don't want to be the one taken. This is not a rapture passage. This is a judgment passage. And here we read in Revelation the account where the hour and day and month and year comes. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God. This is where the martyrs were praying, when will justice come? Saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Here's a description of these forces coming to kill. And by the way, mankind there sounds like everyone in the world because of the translation, that translation is just means people. So it kill a third of the people. Um, and since we, our interpretation would be that this is happening in Jerusalem, the land of Israel, it's talking about a third of the people in Jerusalem. Um, notice that these folks have been prepared. The other fascinating thing is that they are released from the Euphrates. Now, the Euphrates is up on the northeast edge of the Holy Land. This is the river that the Assyrians crossed and the Babylonians crossed when they came over to capture uh, both Israel and Judah when they were both taken into captivity. Fascinatingly, also the Euphrates is where Titus got many of his troops, we find from Josephus that Titus requested a large number of troops that came from the river Euphrates down to Jerusalem to conquer Jerusalem. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. Anybody know what number that is? What did what'd you get? Who's? 200 million. That's a lot. That's a big army. Do you guys have any idea how big current? There's never been an army that big. I'll say it that way. <laughs> never been an army near that big. Now, what's interesting is the Greek doesn't say 10,000 times 10,000. The Greek uses a word that we've already read in Revelation, and that's myriad, which means a lot. And it, it specifically says two myriad myriads which is a lot. And I think that's what we're supposed to understand there. It is interesting that because they translate it into numbers, people make a big deal of the numbers, but the numbers aren't original. The numbers are a translation. Um, I think we make it a number because it says, I heard their number, and we want to know what he heard. But I'll tell you what, you don't know what he heard. What we know is that there were a lot, and he heard their number. And this, is how, and this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. Stop. How many of you are envisioning the horses we just read about in the uh, fifth trumpet? Completely different. Those guys are done. They're gone. Now we got a whole new vision with a whole new horse. Don't put any of that stuff on this horse. You with me? Um. Uh, these are mounted troops, 
uh, a big group. This is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplate plates the color of fire, sapphire, and of sulfur. The heads of the horses were like lion's heads, uh, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths by these three plagues. A third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. Uh, for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads. And by means of them they wound. So, again, if this was a physical, visual thing, which it is not, this horse would have a snake hanging out the back with a head snapping at you. That is horrifying. <laughs> the point is, you're not going to sneak up on these guys. They're coming, and they're going to wipe you out, and there is no escape. Um, by the way, some of what is described here very much looked like the way they would um, protect their horses and prepare their horses for army, or for army, for war. Um, and we see that a third of mankind or the third of the people were killed. I, I do want to catch, every time we read this, I want to be mindful of the fact that it's a third. It feels like the way these descriptions are going is that basically everyone was wiped out. 90%, 100%, 70%. What percent? 30%, 33.333. There you go, nerds. Um, <laughs> um, a third was wiped out. Again, that's a message of restraint because there are some that survive and here John records something about those who survive. The rest of the people of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Here representing kind of the Ten Commandments, the, the commands before having solely God as our God, worshiping only God, and how we treat each other. That's kind of the breakdown of the Ten Commandments. Here's this idea that in the midst of all of this difficulty, people did not give up on the things they trusted in. And that reveals a lack of understanding who God is. And I see it in our world today. When people experience hardship, they turn away from God. Why would he do this to me? You've heard it, right? Why would God let this happen to me? I'm not going to believe in him. That'll teach him. And in reality, there is judgment for sin. And here in the midst of this judgment, God extends his hand by giving his son on our behalf. He has made great sacrifice on our behalf. And if we trust in him, we will be forgiven of our sins. And the judgment of God will not come upon us. Here as we see this sixth angel blow the sixth trumpet, next week we'll enter into chapter 10 and we will have another break before the seventh trumpet, like we had a break between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. We'll talk about a big picture thing that kind of encompasses where we're going with this book. And as we do, I want us to not lose sight of the fact that God is a God of justice. We'll see a lot of that here. And people missed his Messiah, those very people who he sent the Messiah to rejected him. But God is not only a God of justice, but God is a God of grace, and he holds out his hand to these people. God does not desire that any of them be lost. 
but justice will be done. That is a balance of a godly God. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this uh, chapter, uh, so many things and they're so odd, and yet in the midst of it, I pray that you would give us insight and wisdom into its un- understanding to its meaning, not only for them, but for us today. We might be mindful of how to uh, accept your forgiveness and to live our life in your love and to recognize that judgment is a real thing. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to have uh, Mackenzie and Greg, and they're going to read us this chapter. And I hope that as we've talked about it, now you can read along and get a sense of what this chapter is really talking about. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green plant, or any tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, and the hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, And their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and sapphire and of sulfur, and the heads were horses like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed, and by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For by the power of the horses, I'm sorry, for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, and their tails are like serpents with heads, And by means of them, they wound. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So next week we move on to chapter 10. Um, and I would encourage you to read that chapter. Ben's going to come on up. Um, As you read chapter 10, um, it is a pretty straightforward standalone chapter, so be brave. Go ahead and read it. Um, And it's got some fascinating um, uh, images in it, and I encourage you to look at cross-references as you read that chapter. It will cross-reference you to some very specific things in the Old Testament that John is alluding to in chapter 10, and I think it'll help prepare you for our discussion next week.